Wellness, Transforming Self and Society with Compassion. I am David Blake Willis, Professor of Anthropology at Fielding Graduate University, speaking to you from early morning Friday in Kobe, Japan. At a time when we're facing seemingly insurmountable challenges in the public health, political, and environmental spheres of our lives, the practice of mindfulness has enabled many of us to reduce our stress, enhance our attention, and, and encourage us with a newfound tranquility. Mindfulness has become a powerful new and old way to connect us with our deep inner selves. Transformation, awakening, and awareness are key benefits of this practice. What we will experience today takes us all to another level, to the compassion we all need as individuals and as a society. We will learn about heartfulness and its eight principles that enable us to find a new mind and heart. Our speaker, Dr. Stephen Murphy Shigematsu, a dear colleague and fielding professor for many years, has recently been teaching in Zen temples in Japan on the journey of the middle road of one of Japan's most mysterious pilgrimages in the forests of Wakayama. As a special advisor and teacher to one of Japan's largest consumer corporations, and as an advisor to many schools, nonprofits, and other educational institutions in Japan and North America. He has been a bestseller in Japan with his Shinsho, a popular form of book that reaches the masses in Japan, and has numerous books and articles in academia in North America, Asia, and Europe. His most recent book is From Mindfulness to Heartfulness, Transforming Self and Society with Compassion. Other books include When Half is Whole, Multicultural Encounters, Synergy, Healing, and Empowerment, and a book we did together, Transcultural Japan at the Borders of Race, Gender, and Identity. A psychologist, Fulbrighter, and graduate of Harvard University, Stephen has a distinguished career helping many people. On a personal note, we have known each other in Japan in America since the 1980s. I learned of Fielding Graduate University through Stephen, actually through his wife, China. Uh, while Stephen was on a sabbatical from the University of Tokyo at Stanford University in the early 2000s, we were in frequent touch, talking about our book, conferences, and so on. One day I called him from Kobe, Japan, where we have a home. His wife, China, answered the phone and said, oh, Stephen isn't here now, but we have good news. He got a job at a new university, something called F F um, uh, Freedom University, I think. Ah, that sounded intriguing, I thought. And the rest is history, as they say. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our president, Katrina Rogers, who will share a few words of introduction to Stephen and his work. Katrina's own work on how people's worldviews are brought to bear on the actualization of sustainability deeply relates to what Stephen will be sharing with us. Katrina? Thank you, David. And Dr. Murphy Shigematsu, um, we are very honored by your presence with us today in our community. And I really look forward to our time together. And I hope for all of you who are listening that you too will, will have the opportunity to listen deeply, reflect, and think about how what we talk about in this session helps apply to your own scholarship and your own practice. As David mentioned, my field is sustainability, environmental issues. I've studied climate issues and environmental politics since the 80s. A question that we grapple with in my field is how do we link the healing of ourselves to healing the planet? And what is that connection between self-care and care for the planet? Some of you will know the renowned spiritual teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, who argues that peace in the world is only possible when there's peace within ourselves. And once the qualities of peace, that is love, compassion, and altruism, are cultivated within us, then we can expand and extend this peace from the individual to the family, from the family to the community, and from the community to the world. This is not necessarily a linear process. There are strategies towards self-healing and healing the planet. And these things are interwoven and they're mutually reinforce, reinforcing. And the opposite of peace is violence. In the case of climate cha change, the anthropogenic cause devastation, primarily as a result of massive natural resource extraction, could be seen as the ultimate violence against other species as well as ourselves. And I think the parallel here in the same way, Stephen explores those tensions within us as a path into heartfulness, moving from what, we, what is required to build the kind of self-awareness and mindfulness 
into that heartfulness community that is so key to my field as well. And that ultimately heartfulness is the path to the greater community. So as participants, I invite you to listen in, use the time for self-reflection and to build our own capacities for both the art and the work ahead of us. And as we turn to this together, I'll now turn it back over to you, David, and thank you for welcoming me as your colleague. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Katrina. Stephen? Hi, konnichiwa. Shigematsu desu. え、え、逆境化あるかもしれないけど、あの、まあ、フィールディングに戻ったっていうような感じで、本当にまあ、皆さんの顔が見えないんですけれども、あの、まあ、本当に親しい気持ちでありますので、よろしくお願いいたします。That's pretty much all I have to say. I think I've pretty much summed up what I've learned over my lifetime in uh, just a few words and um we could probably go right to the Q&A right now, I think. Well, besides being a fool, I'm just, um, I started like this, uh, hoping that we would somehow, uh, you might feel a little bit disoriented. Uh, you might feel a little bit of the feeling that what's familiar is not familiar. You know, the ordinary seminar, uh, course, class, uh, Zoom meeting is a little bit different. And I think when we go to that space, we can sense something inside of us uh, that's a little bit vulnerable. Uh, it opens up something inside of us that we say, when we realize we can't quite grasp what's happening uh, with what we know, what we can rely on, our worldview, the way we see things, something is different that's going on. And we have to uh, make some kind of an adjustment in our minds to what's happening so that we can really uh, understand what it is that's happening. Uh, and from here, I wanna share some, some slides with you um, as I talk to help uh, my presentation. So I'm gonna share my screen. And uh, so hopefully you can see what I'm seeing. Uh, and I wanted to start from this place of vulnerability because I think that's where we all are at this moment. And you know, certainly in all of our lifetimes, there are moments in which we feel vulnerable. Things happen to us that are beyond what we have been able to experience before. Uh, but at this moment, everyone is feeling this sense of vulnerability uh, because there is something happening that uh, we have never confronted before. And we're all left with this sense about, of uh, uncertainty. Uh, we're not really sure what's happening and how to deal with it. Uh, there's a sense that the world that we have known until now is no longer 
the world that we're living in. Uh, and of course, there's incredible loss. Uh, and so many people have lost their lives. So many people have lost loved ones. Uh, and those who have not faced death themselves, there's been all kinds of other losses from jobs, you know, just the routines, the kinds of things that are familiar to us that help us to get through the day, um, the dreams, all these kinds of pleasures that we relied on, um, the customs, and certainly major kinds of events like the Olympics, but also the more ordinary events that affect all of our lives, the, the ceremonies. Uh, and even most of all, it's really been the loss of the grieving rituals. Uh, you know, cultures all over the world have developed ways of coping, uh, helping us to get through the grief, uh, rituals that bring us together in ways that help us to process what's happening uh, and to move on from there. And those things, those grieving rituals have been taken from us. Uh, we don't have those anymore. There's no way that we can really process the grief. And this is added to the incredible uh, you know, stress and um, the mental health burdens that so many people face. Um, this is my grandmother, Mary, and I was uh, shocked to realize that I had actually lost my own grandmother the last time we had this kind of a pandemic. This was early in 1918. My grandmother, who was an immigrant from Ireland uh, to the east coast of the United States, um, died from the Spanish flu in 19, early in March of that year. Uh, and I saw the effect that this had on my father for the, the rest of his life, uh, recovering from that childhood loss. And so uh, I can only imagine what so many people are facing now uh, in terms of the losses that they're suffering uh, and the long-term effects that will have on people's families. Uh, we also know that this is a, a moment of possibility and that vulnerability leads to beginner's mind. And beginner's mind has all these, the sense of uh, what, it could, what it could possibly bring to our lives. Uh, and that sense of beginner's mind uh, is also one in, in Buddhism that's linked to the mind of compassion. Uh, so that, that sense of when you can actually see things for the first time in a new way, that that not only opens up your mind, but it also opens up your heart and you're able to feel a whole new sense of compassion. In the Silicon Valley where I live, uh, we also have a lot of uh, gurus talking about how beginner's mind is related to uh, creativity and how that sense of lightness can bring a whole uh, openness and spaciousness that uh, creates a place for new things to come in, new ideas. Uh, and so these kinds of possibilities we can also feel. Um, but at the same time, I'm confronted with this uh, opportunity to speak, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity, but I also recognize that I'm in this place of life in which I have this sense of the greatest poet in Japanese, haiku, uh, said, what's the point of saying everything with words? Uh, and I have this sense of futility about how using words. Um, and I, but I know it from my background, I, I grew up in a family in which my fathers just talked all the time. And my I Irish relatives complained, I didn't talk enough to be a real Murphy. Uh, but I had a mother who rarely spoke more than two words. She come into my room in the morning and wake me up and say, up boy. And then I, she'd say, do you want breakfast? And I'd go, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, mom. And she'd say, make it. And she had a way of uh, being very succinct with her words. And I grew up with this sense of real, also, you know, feeling there was a beauty in words, but the most beautiful sound was the sound of silence. Uh, and that has carried me throughout my life to this present moment. Um, and when I see the poetry of Rumi and this expression that the divine in me has never spoken a word by 
what I think of as the greatest poet I know. Uh, and I realized I'd become a lot more like the poet Gibran, who we had this spoke of the, being a seeker of silences. Uh, but he also taught, said that there's a treasure in the silences that he felt a responsibility to share with other people. Uh, and I feel like that's another part of you know, wanting to be silent is that those who have really expressed an appreciation of silence and contemplation and spirituality also have spoken about the need to break that silence and that sometimes silence can be a betrayal of uh, can be an act of cowardice to not express what you really feel needs to be expressed. Uh, and so in, in speaking for a long time now, I've come to feel that the best way I can speak is in stories uh, because stories have a power of showing our humanness in a ways that when we speak in a cognitive, rational, analytical manner, we can't do that. Um, and in the spirit of uh, spiritual teachers like Ramdas, I believe that it's it's something that we can all do if we reflect on our lives, that we can see and see the value of the stories that might exist for other people. Uh, in, the, in that sense, sharing our stories can be a way of, of providing some kind of guidance for other people in their stories, in their own lives. If you look at these, what uh, Japanese call kanji, which are characters originating from China, you can see how they're, how closely related the story is to enlightenment. So on the, the left side, you have the, the character for story uh, and the left side of that means the word. And on the right side, you have the kanji for enlightenment and the left side of that is the heart. Uh, and so my, the way I visualize it is this sense that the story takes you so close to the truth and to the truth of enlightenment, but the story has to then be transformed into the heart. Uh, uh, today, I also want to be with you with this sense of being an old fool. Uh, and these are two kanji, which are the left one is a horse and the right one is a deer. And so the being the fool has this sense about you see the horse, but you call it a deer or you get, you know, you kind of like uh, present reality in, in different ways. And I have a great um, mentor at Fielding and being an old fool. And uh, Charlie really, Charlie Seashore really taught me a lot about what is this act of being a fool? And the, well, baka is the word for a fool in Japanese, but if you add o to the beginning and san to the end, it has a sense of being a wonderful fool. Uh, and, if, and there's something in that foolishness, the way that Charlie would tell us, you know, make, uh, light of this whole sense of what is an adult? Are we, you know, when are we any of, any of us going to become adults? Um, and, you know, those of you who were lucky enough to know Charlie know, knew the way in which he used that whole sense of, of foolishness and lightness and his use of the self, of course, in teaching that was, he you know, was one of my guides in learning how to use uh, that as both in teaching, but also in the learning, the sense that I always felt he was learning as he went along. Um, I also exist more in this, uh, what Japanese call the chodo, which is this sense of being an old soul, um, not quite as old as uh, Yoda, who apparently I guess was in his 900s, but I'm, I got a ways to go before that. But the sense of almost being here and not here, uh, being human and not human, uh, and, but also, offering oneself as being further down the road than a lot of people. Uh, and therefore in this position of being, seeing life as something that you have experienced rather than something that you anticipate or read about in books. Um, so the story I have to tell is, is really simple. It, and it begins with the sense of awe and mystery and miracle and gratitude uh, just for the, real, the reality of my own existence. The fact that I'm even here with you in this moment is all due to this sense of 
uh, all due to the fact that I was born, you know, that I was created, that there was no me at one moment and the next moment there was this me and I had the help of people, of course, to bring me into this place. Um, but that the miracle of existence is something that I reflect on every day, just simply the fact that I'm here uh, and the gratitude for that gift of life. Uh, my life goes on through many years and there's often this sense of the metaphor of the moon that I'm trying to understand who I am. Uh, and that the part of me that I un un is understandable to some degree is the part that's in the light. Uh, but much of me is in the dark, it's in the shadows and doesn't really, uh, I don't really know who that is. Uh, and this is the way I move through my youth and go into a, a place in my youth in which I'm feel really lost in a sense of the, these, the broken connections uh, disillusioned, alienated, isolated, and cynical. <clears throat> and at that time, there was a, a song came on the radio. Is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball. If that's all there is. And I I thought this is a great song. It really just summed up the way I felt. Um, but I gradually started to realize there was a key word in the song that I didn't notice at first. And that was, if, if that's all there is. And I realized that the singer still had hope that there was something more to life than a series of disappointments and disillusionments uh, and a sense that life would never really fulfill would never fulfill our dreams. And therefore, the best thing to do was simply to break out the booze, dance, sing, make merry. Um, but the word if really captivated me and I was wanted to know what else was there. Uh, and I struggled through my 20s until uh, one day I was in my apartment. I was living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, up third floor, a old wooden, wooden building. And I smelled smoke. I was in the apartment and I went to the door and opened the door and I saw that there was the whole stairwell was already full of dark smoke. And it was coming rapidly up the stairs. And I thought, well, I got to get out of here. I don't even have enough time to get whatever I have. And But right by the door was my guitar, which I actually I still... I still keep it right by my door. <laughs> so my, my guitar was right by the door. I grabbed that, ran down the stairs, through the smoke, got outdoors, and stood there while the entire building went up in flames. And I realized I had nothing, uh, but I had my life. And I had been, um, strangely enough, raised Catholic, even though my father at that point said he was an agnostic, although he was raised Catholic. Um, and my mother was Buddhist, but um, the agreement that we would to be accepted by the Irish relatives is that the kids would all become Catholic. So I went to Catholic school and Catholic church. Uh, and at that time of the prayer, I remember this, uh, of the fire, this prayer coming to me, and it was really simple. And I don't know if I, had, I assumed I had learned it as a child, uh, but it was, oh my God, you are here. Oh my God. I am here. Oh my God, we are here. And somehow this stayed with me and, and was re repeated to me over and over again. Um, and I felt like what the first part of that, you are here, meant to me that uh, what some people call God and what I had learned to call God in the Catholic Church, but it could also mean simply the mystery of life. Uh, the kind of mystery that Einstein talked about as being so deep that it could be just the same as a religious feeling without the sense of a personal God, but the sense of nature, the universe, our connection to something greater than ourselves. Uh, when I reflected on, oh my God, I am here, I felt that was about me as this, somehow this individual being captured in the side of this body and mind with an identity. Um, 
and with a responsibility that for to live that I was the only one who could really take care of this existence and that I had to have a responsibility to do that. Uh, the third part of that, oh my God, we are here, uh, felt to me as this, uh, what spiritual people call about the connection, uh, the connection between each other, the connection that goes beyond a sense of this isolated, separate uh, existence that we feel, but is that itself is an illusion. Uh, and I started to think of these three connections as vital to our existence, that if I was truly to live, then I needed to somehow feel that these were the connections that I needed to cultivate. Uh, and when I thought about the first, the mystery, I thought about Einstein in this sense that expression of that is the most beautiful experience that we can have is of the mystery of life. Uh, and when I thought about the self, I thought about this, uh, Morita is a, is a Japanese doctor from the time of Freud, uh, but the same sentiment is, is also uh, expressed by humanists like Carl Rogers, this sense of paradox of accepting yourself just as you are, releasing this energy to then change yourself rather than actively trying willfully to change yourself uh, and feeling, therefore, the reality that you're saying to yourself, well, I'm really not good enough. Uh, and so this really captivated me, this sense that if I could accept myself as I was, then I would be able to change. And when I thought about the connections, I thought about this sense, again, that Einstein expressed about how we experience ourselves in this sense of isolation, but it's really an illusion or a delusion of separateness and that if we could, our consciousness was, could expand, we would realize that we were connected in infinite ways beyond what we are able to realize in our normal state of consciousness. Uh, and so thinking of these connections, I also started to think about, I needed to feel a sense of purpose in life. Uh, I needed to feel that, you know, as strange as this journey was, that perhaps there was a purpose for it. And there was a purpose for my life in, in particular. Uh, and that if I was really mindful, if I could really to be uh, aware and awake to, to being alive, that I would somehow be able to sense what that purpose was. Uh, and at that time, there was um, a very popular book, not this one, but The Seven Story Mountain, of Thomas Merton that I read. And it really, I started to get a language also for what I was attempting to do on this journey. And it was this sense of dedicating my life to God, to the, having this sense of service to God. Uh, and what that meant to me was, uh, was unclear though, because I was used, I thought of you know the images I knew from childhood in the Catholic church uh, one of them that I, I still love to this day was the story of Jesus disappearing from his home and his mother, Mary and Joseph going out looking for him and finding him among the wise men. And when she said, how can you do this to your mother? You know, he, he was quite cool about it. And he said, you know, don't you know that I'm here to do my father's work? My father's, that's why I'm here. It's not to make mommy and daddy happy. Uh, but that really hit me as a youth to think, wow, we can really, we have a purpose. Each of us is here, not for our mothers and fathers of this earth, but we're here with some kind of a greater purpose. And we have to find out what that purpose is. Uh, and of course, at this time of Lent, the, the story of the Last Supper uh, was something I was taught as a child. And that was, to me, the ultimate story of Jesus praying in the garden uh, that knowing that what the sacrifice that was being asked was something that uh, he was willing to do, but of course was not hoping for, it would not be the choice, but it was this uh, done with this whole sense that uh, can we give ourselves to God, however we think of God, uh, with a sense that this is, it isn't what I want from life, 
but I'm willing to do whatever life is calling me to do. And that is, uh, and that can be done even if you don't, if you think of God as a personal God, but it can be done even without that sense of a personal God, if you believe that somehow the universe or is, the, is calling you some kind of a higher power is saying that this is what is demanded of you in your life. Uh, I also thought of, about the sense of redemption and what it was that was I was being personally called to do as a person of a particular cultural, ethnic, racial background um, in, a, in the sense of emancipation or redemption um, that is written, that I knew first from Marcus Garvey, but was popularized by Bob Marley right at this same time in my life. And I, so hearing this song about emancipating yourself, uh, starting to think about the need to define oneself and, and to not let other people tell you who you are. Uh, and at that same time in 1979, this was uh, the year my house burned down, a book came out which also uh, aroused this sense of what does it mean to decolonize your mind uh, of the way other people have told you who you are uh, and realizing that you can define yourself uh, as who you are if you really can know who you are. Uh, the same year, another book came out, which I uh, grabbed. It was called Haga Kure, the, the, the Way of the Samurai, uh, which taught about the ways in which the sense of mindfulness that the samurai cultivated to be fully present in life, uh, certainly for the need to be present in battle and be, pre be prepared for death, but also simply in the everyday challenge of existence to be fully present was the way to get through life. Uh, sounds like music is on here. Um, let me move on to the Oops. Oops. Uh, looks like I had some music embedded in here. Um, Brian, you know if I can get rid of that without um, or so, uh, we're quiet it without um, cutting off my voice? Should I exit and get rid of it? I think that'll be best, yeah. Yeah, okay. So hold on a second. I'm going to escape from here. Okay. When you, uh, when you share again, just uh, make sure you're not sharing the sound. <laughs> well, I cut the sound out. Okay, you're good. Let's see. So, okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, that should be good. Let's see. Okay, I think I'm back. Um, <laughs> so I had put the, I used to do a monologue um, in which I would talk about family stories. And so I'd put music into that to make it a little more dramatic. Um, but it's a photo from my high school yearbook in which I was really going through a lot of identity concerns about who I was and trying to find out a sense about where I fit in the world. And um, where my sense of family was. And it was at that time, uh, back about the, after the fire, in which I also came to this uh, feeling of that I, <clears throat> I know somehow this image of returning home came to me. In this sense that um, returning home would give us a reconnecting to uh, an understanding of who I was. And that that returning home meant returning to uh, uh, the ancestors that I knew. My mother is the small, uh, is the baby in the middle of the photo. Uh, but it also meant returning to uh, my grandmother, who was still uh, alive at the time in uh, Japan, and for whom I was the only grandson, um, and for whom 
we have, with whom I had kept a very special relationship uh, and always wondered, you know, how she got to be such a compassionate person, a person who's just, uh, you know, whenever anybody talked about her, it was about her, they used the word kokoro, which is the Japanese word to express this, not just the heart, but a whole sense of soul and spirit, uh, but loving kindness that um, really permeated her existence. And, uh, and when I, as I lived with her, I realized that this whole question of how do you get to be a certain way was answered very simply by watching her in daily life and saying, you get to be that way by being that way. And you get to be compassionate by being compassionate in your daily life. Uh, and that became something that she started to also teach me about uh, who I was in connection to my ancestors. And she said, your great grandfather was somebody that uh, she grew up with uh, and who she watched. He was uh, one of the last samurai. He was, uh, she described him as a Hatamoto who was a, a samurai who is in service to the Shogun uh, and who was in, in charge of protecting the Shogun's daughter uh, and also the education of that daughter, and therefore uh, was full of teachings that he gave to my grandmother. And she would watch him uh, in his morning ritual with his sword. And she said, what are you doing, grandfather? And he said, Tfa, uh, I'm contemplating death. And that helps me to feel more fully alive. Uh, and she said, this is the way she grew up, therefore, to believe that there was something in contemplating death that brought one to be more alive. Uh, he also introduced her as she then introduced me to the tea ceremony, which was a way that uh, of treasuring the present moment. Uh, and there's this expression, Ichigo Ichie. Ichi is the number one. Go is a moment. Uh, and A is a meeting or a coming together. So it has this uh, sense that we are here in this moment, and this is a once in a lifetime moment. And if we can actually be present and awake and aware and mindful in this moment and every moment, we will have experience a richness in living that will never come to us if we're not really here, if we're not really present, if we're somewhere else half the time, which psychology research now tells us we're not even here. Uh, we're only here half the time. We're somewhere else as we're doing this. Uh, if, and if we could only cultivate the sense of Ichigo Ichie, that we could somehow appreciate even the most mundane things in our lives. Uh, and that's something that they cult is cultivated by the tea ceremony itself. Uh, the tea house, as you can see on the right, is a house that has a very low, uh, a narrow door. Uh, so to get into that tea house, the samurai had to remove any armor and certainly the swords that were there, which would not allow them to get into, this, into the tea house. They had to also bow their heads because the door was so low. And the, the, those two acts were the beginning of what you could call cultivating vulnerability and humility. Uh, to enter that space, they had to be demonstrate vulnerability and humility. Uh, and these are the ways that um, you can see in this expression, uh, Ichigo Ichie, but also in Bushido. And so here I'd like to just show a very short uh, clip from the film, uh, The Last Samurai. And uh, many of you know the story, um, but it's, the story is of an American military man is captured, who is played by Tom Cruise, is captured by the Japanese samurai, uh, who is also, and the head samurai is also uh, a monk. Uh, and they decide to keep Tom Cruise alive and to teach him the ways of the samurai. And so they're in this very short clip, you can see uh, Tom Cruise is receiving a lesson in what is uh, the way of the samurai. What else has she told you? You have nightmares? 
Every soldier has nightmares. Only one who is ashamed of what he has done. You have no idea what I have done. I don't want that. You have seen many things. I have. You do not fear that. But sometimes you wish for it. Is this not so? Yes. I was so. It happens to men who have seen what we have seen. And then I come to this place of my ancestors. I never remember like these poor selves. We are all dying. To know life in every breath, every cup of tea, every life we take, the way of the warrior. Life in every breath. That is Bushido. I hope I'm back to my screen. Um, Brian, can you confirm I'm back? You are back. Okay, great. Um, so he says here that you have seen many things and do not fear death. And even sometimes you wish for it and acknowledges that he himself feels that way. But then he comes to this place of his ancestors and remembers that like these cherry blossoms, we are all dying. So to know life in every breath, every cup of tea, every life we take, the way of the warrior. He calls this Bushido. Uh, and Bushido is the way of the samurai, the samurai code. Um, and this was something that my grandmother told me as a way of how to live a good life. Uh, and it was, it was hard for me to accept, to think that death was not a depressing thought, but death was something that you could actually feel more life in uh, if you could go to that place of contemplating it and to actually having making it a ritual part of your life that you would every day prepare yourself for the possibility of dying uh, and that that would not depress you but that that would even uplift you because it would focus you on what is truly meaningful in that day and simply the awareness that you were alive and had a life to live uh, Stephen, uh, yeah, PowerPoint is not being shared. Oh, Just, you know, okay. Let me try some. My apologies. Here. Okay. Uh, what was being shared? Just me talking. Yes, which is wonderful. <laughs> you like looking at your face. Uh, <laughs> well, you were at slide forty-six. Okay. Let me go back here. See if this does it. How's that? That's good. That's better? Okay. Yep. Um, and what also really struck me was this sense of, like these blossoms, we are all dying. And that, um, you know, to feel that sense of the brevity of life, you know, the, what's, you know why, why Japanese cherish the cherry blossom so much is because they are here just for a moment. Um, they're fleeting, they're beautiful, but they're here and they're gone. And, you know, I was just thinking about dogs. My, um, a friend of mine called me last night. Her dog was uh, hit by a car and suddenly died. And they'd only had the dog for less than two years. And, um, and even if a dog lives a natural life, a dog is there just for a brief moment, you know, and, uh, and then we too, if we think about time in the universe, we're all here just for a brief moment. Uh, and to see that every day and to put our lives into that context um, 
it doesn't have to be depressing. It can be something that instead puts us into this sense of wonder and awe and beauty and, and appreciation, gratitude that we actually have this day to live. Uh, and so the tea ceremony is, is a way of cultivating that, you know, to really feel that every day you can engage in a kind of ritual that will help you to say, to focus on this reality that you can appreciate life just in the cup of tea. And you can appreciate life uh, in every breath, which has become of course so important in this moment in which we are faced with possible death from uh, a disease that stops our breathing. Uh, and at a time in which we are so, uh, many people have been so horrified and also enlivened by the mantra of, I can't breathe, uh, that the, literally the lives of people can be crushed by crushing their breath. Uh, and knowing that that cry is a sign of the cry, the cry for life, right? to be alive, and that we need to, to, to create not only our own lives, but a society in which we can breathe and that we will not be, our breaths will not be crushed, especially by those in, in, from injustice. This is all um, what my grandmother was teaching me is also known by many other kinds of expressions. Some of you know the expression wabi-sabi, mono no aware, but it all expresses this sense of Zen Buddhist imperfection, impermanence, and incompleteness, which embracing it gives a kind of a sense of freedom that we don't have to be. Uh, we can not attach ourselves to perfection and to permanence and to completeness and to somehow live with more with a sense of freedom. And the sense of imperfection, we can also uh, embrace rather than reject. So this is, this is a Japanese art form called kintsugi. Uh, when we had these pots in our house in which they were, uh, the story is that their pot, a valued pot was broken, returned to the maker and said, put it back together, expecting that it would come back as good as new. It came back instead like this with the places where it had been fractured and broken were not hidden, but they were highlighted. Uh, and if you think of ourselves as like these pots of kintsugi, then our places in which we have been marked, the places in which we have been scarred, the places we have these uh, show where we have been hurt, wounded, by life, um, instead of hiding them, we can highlight them as a way of saying, this is where we are stronger. This is where we are more beautiful as human beings because we have been wounded and we have somehow put ourselves back together again in this beautiful form. Uh, my grandmother also told me that, you know, you are Stephen though, you are not a samurai. There are no more samurai and you're not in the military like your relatives once were um, and the war is over. And unlike this soldier in the, this is from the scene actually from the letters from Iwo Jima, the film uh, in which the commanding general faces his imminent ritual suicide. And at that moment he says, I came here to die for my family but I find that there is now this other me that wants to live because of my family. Uh, and at that age, I was feeling this sense of, I'm willing to die for something. I'm willing to sacrifice my life. Uh, and my grandmother changed the question for me. She said, okay, I see what you said, you're willing to die for something, but I wanna ask you, what are you willing to live for? Uh, and this put things in a very different perspective for me. What am I willing to live for? Uh, what am I, where do I see purpose? Uh, and I thought of this Thich Nhat Hanh expression that, you know, looking for miracles uh, in, 
something extraordinary uh, was perhaps not the way I would really find the truth and really find out how to live in this world. But instead, the simply living in this world, walking on this earth was enough of a challenge that if I could accept that challenge, then I would find the way to truly live well. Uh, and what that meant for me was really focusing on this sense of, of heartfulness. And if you look at the kanji, you can see it has a very simple meaning. It's composed of two parts. One, which simply is the now or the present. The other is the heart or the soul. Uh, and so it has a sense of bringing yourself as much as possible into this present moment and being here. Uh, and from ancient wisdom, East Asian wisdom, we know that there's a sense that if you're living in the past, that's a way of being depressed. If you're living in the future, it's a way of being anxious. And if you can only live in the present, then you will feel a sense of peace. Uh, and so at this moment, I think a lot of us are feel like we're awakening and we're seeing the world in a way that we have never seen things before and there are possibilities in there. Uh, and I think that I, there's a great expression of that in this film, Awakenings, which is, uh, I think the original Oliver Sacks, the neurologist uh, books, which was turned into a movie in which there are uh, a number of people in this hospital who have been in a really uh, sleep comatose state for many years. Uh, and the doctor played by uh, Robin Williams tries to figure out how we can help these people to wake up uh, and has discovered that the use of a drug L-dopamine will actually bring people back to life, but bring people are really awake. And so there's the scene I just would like to show you in which um, the character played by Robert De Niro who has been asleep for 20 years comes alive and comes awake. Leonard? Leonard? Dr. Sayer, sit down, sit down. Why? What's wrong? We've got to tell everybody. We, 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 we've got to remind them. We've got to remind them how good it is. How good what is, Leonard? Read the newspaper. I don't what's it say? It's all bad. It's all bad. People have forgotten what life is all about. They've forgotten what it is to be alive. They need to be reminded. They need to be reminded about what they have and what they can lose. And what I feel is the joy of life, the gift of life, the freedom of life, the wonderment of life. Wait, he kept saying that people don't appreciate the simple things. Work, play, friendship, family. It's... And he was so excited, he talked till five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I don't know whether this is liberation, mania, or love. Yes, Christ. What he's saying is absolutely right, though. We don't really know how to live. Stephen, I think I'm back. Okay. You? Um, so I love this scene because he is awake, right? He's actually awake. And that's, you know, it's quite frightening for the doctor to see this. And it reminds me of the, what Henry David Thoreau wrote. I've never met a human who was fully awake. If I had, how would I have looked him in the eye? Uh, and you can see the, the fear in Robin Williams, like what is, what is this incredible creature who is actually awake and awake enough to see what life is all about, what's really valuable in life and feeling this incredible joy and beauty of life, the freedom, the wonderment, um, but also putting it in the sense of the simple things. It's the simple things in life that are so meaningful, work, play, friendship, family. Um, and when you think about this sense about coming alive, you know, uh, I'm always reminded by something that Howard Thurman wrote about coming alive. And that, that's what, you know, if you think about, there's so many things 
that need to be done in the world that it's just overwhelming. But if you can just focus yourself on what makes you come alive and then having the courage and the determination to do that because that's what the world really needs. And in that though, I think we're all full of fear. Uh, and there's a, you know, an expression in Buddhism, the lion's roar, which is supposedly the, the not having fear. Um, but to me, fear is part of what is keeps us human. Uh, but we have to live with that fear and overcome that fear and do something with that fear. And if we can do that, it gives us this sense of gratitude. Uh, and I'm, I'm reminded that something our, our dear Barnett Pierce, who as many of you know on our faculty, uh, wrote this. And it was this you know, sense that we are so many people like the, the twins that I showed you in the previous file who grew up with uh, cystic fibrosis, knowing that their lives could end at any any time, and they saw, you know, literally hundreds of their friends die, uh, and they one of them has already passed away, but the other is alive due to the miracle of having a double lung transplant. Uh, but what I've learned from being with people who have faced death and are still here is this both a sense of joy that they were able to find what's really meaningful in life. Um, and also a sense of, you know, as Barnett expresses here, don't make the universe shout so loud to get your attention. You know, is there, a, and I, you know, I have often wonder all the time, is there a way to wake up without being confronted so harshly with death? You know, you know, as the, in the uh, film, the It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, the Mr. Rogers film, the father is on his deathbed and says, you know, it's, it's not fair. I'm just figuring out how to live my life. I just know how much I love my son now and how much the love of my son means to me. And now I don't have any time left. And, and I thought of a book I read as a youth, The Denial of Death, uh, and how it really influenced me. And I looked at it recently and I thought, you know, that Becker wrote this, you know, really dreary uh, reflection on what it's like to go through your life and you get to this place of being, you're 60 years old and you finally have figured out what life is all about and how to live and you've got no time left. So I got curious recently, I looked up about Becker and I realized Becker died when he was 39. Becker had no idea what it was like to be 60. And I do, I'm 60, Barnett was 60. Uh, and we know what it's like to be at this age and to still be alive. And that has something I think about every day, the fact that you know, certainly it takes so long and it takes every day still to try to understand the best way to live. Uh, but I am still alive and there is a way that I can re have resolve every day to live, uh, as Barnett says here, committed to doing good in those few moments that I have. Uh, it's something I, I found excre extremely important in this, keeping this in my life in an eight, everyday basis is this sense uh, put into words by Viktor Frankl of how the survivors of the Nazi concentration camps seem to be changing their question about why is this happening to me? What do I want from life? To asking, what is life asking of me? What is it I am called to do? How do I need to respond in this moment to what life is demanding of me? And that this is the way I will be able to get through even the greatest hardships. Uh, and so he has this expression, can you say yes to life uh, in spite of everything? Can you say, I'm willing to live, I want to live, uh, that there is a way uh, I want to do my best with life, um, that I'm willing to live for something and to ask yourself what that is. And often you find it's right in the palm of your hand. There's this Japanese expression, 
Myoju Tanagokoro, that the treasure is already there. You already know what to do. You already have the opportunity right in front of you to do good. Uh, and so it gives some voice to this expression of to think global, but to act local. Do what you can in right that's right there in front of you, and you have the ability to do that. Uh, I also draw strength from uh, inspirations like the serenity prayer, which you know, asks for that serenity to accept the things you cannot change, because there are so many things in all of our lives that we can't change. Um, and we want the courage in the, to be honest with the, ourselves about what really can be changed and to be able to step forward with, and to bring our voices to causes that we really believe in to betray uh, and to break that silence that we feel needs to be broken. Uh, and all of this, I feel, takes something that you might call trust in life or faith in life. Uh, religion calls it faith, but it could be in many different forms that we find the way to follow our heart, to follow a belief that we just need to keep going. Um, and there's many ways that we can find that, that makes help us to make sense of our life. Uh, but each of us has to find that ourselves. And I, for me, I find that in the people that have been given me the most in my life, this is my mother who just turned 97 uh, and who has osteoporosis. Uh, and therefore, every time she falls, she shatters parts of her body. Um, but bounces back up with this Japanese expression, nana korobi yaoki. Uh, she keeps getting back up and she lives what I, with what I feel is a sense of fierceness uh, to get through everything, but also this gentleness that kind of goes with the flow of, of life. And you know, when I say, I say something, like, oh, that's so bad, mom. She goes, oh, she laughs and says, no, well, you know, that's the way life is. You know, you just got to roll with it and keep going because you never know what life is going to bring. Um, and you just got to be able to also laugh and, and go with whatever life brings you and to think that this is all just part of it. It's all part of a big whole. Uh, I also draw inspiration from my father who, uh, the last things he said to me was, uh, everything's going to be all right. And I felt that what he was saying was certainly not that only good things are going to happen to you. Um, but it was a way of saying that I'm, he himself was all right. He was seeing, I think that he was close, close to the gate. Uh, he was sensing that he was coming to another realm of existence and that it was all right. He was okay. Uh, and then assuring me that I would be all right. Uh, and this an expression of, I have faith in you, that no matter what happens, you'll be able to get through it uh, and that you will be all right. Um, when my grandmother uh, passed away, this was uh, just three years ago, at the age of 111, she was one of the oldest people known in the world at the time, um, but had an incredible spirit that, uh, and a life energy. Um, but when I was told that she was dying, I went, uh, I was in the US at the time and I went to Japan uh, because they said we had to decide whether to keep her alive or not. Uh, and when I got there, I was felt really disheartened because uh, she seemed to be in a coma. But when I called her name, I said, Obachan and Steven Des, and it's me, I'm here. She opened her eyes for a moment and looked into my eyes and I felt she was also without words saying, um, it's all right. You know, I'm, I can feel myself floating. I can feel the, I'm near the gate. I'm in close to some other realm and I'm okay. But more than that, it was like telling me you're okay. You'll be okay. And I know that I must have had fear in my eyes. Um, but she was saying me, that's what I felt was the look of, of compassion. Uh, that you will be all right. And I'm here, you know, just like you're still this little baby and this little boy that I have looked after my whole life. And I want you to know that you will be okay. And I have trust and faith in you 
to be that way. Um, in the temple where she died, in uh, the town where she died, there was a poster on the wall that said in, in translation, to be grateful, to begin with gratitude and to end with gratitude and to have gratitude simply for life itself. Uh, and this is what I felt I gained most from my elders, certainly from my grandmother, this sense that uh, if we could only feel gratitude even for our own birth, you know, for our existence. Uh, and at the end of life, to feel simply gratitude, that that's all that re seemed to remain for her. Uh, she simply was doing this you know, gush show all the time and saying arigato, which is just thank you. You're just thanking everybody. Um, and I got a sense that this was the way to live, to feel gratitude for the beginning of life, to feel gratitude for the end of life, uh, and that if that we could do that, uh, that somehow our lives would be rich in that sense of ichigo, ichie, to live with a sense of appreciation for each moment. Um, so I'm gonna end here because I'd like to have some time to talk with my colleagues, uh, David and Katrina, so if we could I think I'll stop sharing my slides and to go to a um, being able to talk with you. Stephen Domo, arigato gozaimashita. Thank you so much for your wonderful sharing. I like the last thing you said, uh, almost the last thing you said, this is the way to live. And uh, I was particularly struck by your bringing uh, Bob Marley's redemption song in there yeah. and how, how important redemption is uh, for, for all of us. And I think also of uh, Rita Marley, Bob's uh, wow. wife who had a song, Harambe, and Harambe in Swahili means working together, pulling together, helping each other, you know, caring, sharing. And uh, much of what you have been uh, doing with us today is, is simply that. There's a, there's a Harambe moment here in what you've been sharing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm curious here about your, your further thoughts on redemption in, in the month that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, this has just been a crazy month. I mean, of course, the last year has, has been unbelievable, uh, but particularly this last month. Um, where, where, where are you with everything right now? I'm feeling um, incredibly privileged to be able to be in the safety of my home, um, to have a garden, to I can walk in the garden every day, um, to have food, um, to have a job in which I don't need to go out uh, to be in among people who may have uh, you may have the disease. Um, and I'm feeling some, um, I guess, a strangeness between um, life and death, kind of in a very strange place of both uh, every day appreciating that I have life, but also uh, letting go, the sense of not attaching to things um, and to really wanting to um, and part of it is just simply my, my age, the, the stage of life I'm in, um, and to be to die at any moment now would not be at all unusual and strange. Um, and so every day feeling that I'm more acutely aware of being in that state of living and dying, that uh, I will, um, yesterday a student wrote to me, 23 years old, uh, no health problems. Uh, sensei, I have to tell you, I just, I had a stroke two months ago. Uh, I don't have the full use of my right side of my body. I'm, um, I'm accepting what's happened to me, but I'm fighting like hell for in rehabilitation. And I thought, oh, <clears throat> this is, this captures what I am feeling and want to feel every day that you know, the sense of, of letting go that what I can't control, I want to be able to not be attached to that. Um, 
but what I can control, I really want to, to fight like hell. And so that, you know, the Dylan Thomas sense of uh, the poem, do not go gentle into the night. Um, I feel very strongly, I, I want to go gentle into the night. But if it's not nighttime yet, Dylan Thomas was another guy who only lived to 39 and didn't know what it was like to be old. And when you want to go gentle into the night, but if you're if on if that's not my fate, I want to fight like hell to be alive and to live fully. Where are you at this moment? Well, again, the ichigo ichie uh, <laughs> living at the particular moment, and here we are. It's uh, you know I'm I'm just honored to be able to share this uh, dialogue with you, and uh, I often think too about uh, the movie Ikiru. Um, for those of you who would like to see this, it was ranked by the New York Times as, as the number one movie of the 20th century. Ikiru, I-K-I-R-U, I-K-I-R-U. Ikiru in Japanese means to live. And it's about a man at the end of his life who finds out that he has cancer and what is he going to do with those remaining days. I'm also with you. I'm at that point, I mean, we are, uh, meditating on the vulnerability and the mortality and seeing people we know and love leaving us, uh, especially this last year with the pandemic and uh, with the terrible things that have been happening for, for literally centuries with black folks and with indigenous peoples and, you know, feeling, feeling the responsibility there and whatever we can do to share there. I, I think of our colleague Four Arrows too, who himself is, uh, you know, in a very vulnerable state and how important it is to look seven generations back and seven generations ahead. So thank you for the ancestors. Uh, that's, that's really important. Um, at the same time, you know, to live, uh, Ikiru, uh, what can we do at this moment? What can we do at this moment? And part of it is to embrace, uh, the needs that are out there. And uh, Katrina has spoken of uh, the needs that are out there in terms of sustainability. And mm -hmm. I think about those, those images that are out there for all of us of fire, water, air, earth, and, and how important it is for us to connect with all of those. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, thank you so much for the garden. And maybe you could talk just a little bit more about the garden. And then I also wanna hear your thoughts about sensei. Uh, <laughs> Sensei, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to follow what you you start talking about to live, uh, the movie, and how you know what what he finds. He feels like his life has been just a, a complete waste. He's just been a a bureaucrat, moving papers from one side of the desk to the other, and then he finds he has cancer, and then he meets this young woman who is just full of vit vitality and happiness and joy. And he has this strange sense, like he wants to almost like tear her apart and find out what is the secret. And she said, there's no secret. I just make these little toys for children. And he says, wow, maybe that's it. You know, it's service, right? It's, it's, if I can do something for somebody else, then that will make my life meaningful, even if it's only for a short time. And so he re remembers that these mothers have been asking for a park for their children to play in. And it's, uh, there's been a chemical waste site that these you know, corrupt corporations have, have uh, put there and the children have no place to play. And he makes that his, what gives his life meaning even in those last few moments of service to others and to giving something to those children and to those families. And that's, you know, to me, that's that's the beauty of what he discovers in how to live. Is um, I'm wondering about Katrina was going to join us, right? I, I uh, Brian just uh, texted. I think she needed to step off. I, oh, okay. I hope she'll be able to come back and join us. Uh, talk about do. someone who is doing seva, seva. You know, the the work for others. Uh, she's certainly certainly yeah. there. That's um, uh, okay. I could, you want to say something? I could, it, I'll, I'll your garden, later. I'd love to hear about your garden. The garden. So the other, you know, part of that is simply uh, 
being responsible for something and nourishing something or just seeing uh, that sense of mystery in life. And I've, um, you know, I go out into the garden every day and I just, I see things I've never seen before, <laughs> you know, just the mystery of the, a tree and the, you know, the beauty, intricate beauty of a flower, of a spider web. And I think, oh my God, I've been living here for so long, but I've just told myself, over and over again, I'm too busy. I'm too busy to stop. <laughs> and, and, and I'm the one who is supposedly the teacher about this. And yet I'm driven by this sense of I'm always just too damn busy to stop to smell the flowers. And so that's been, you know, part of the joy of being here has really been just to and just even, even in this little garden, you know, there's everything. There's trees and flowers and moss. And there's, uh, there's even a little owl that comes to visit once in a while at night. When, and I've been able to, you know, walk up to, and I, I have a photograph I'll send you of the owl. But, the, you know, the incredible, I just go, I go out there before I go to bed and look up at the, at the moon and the stars if it's out. And I just, think, wow, my, my life is just this puny little, puny little thing in, in terms of this time and space. Uh, and yet it's, it's everything too, right? It's, it's that whole sense of wholeness and yin and yang. And it's, um, it's both, we are everything and we are nothing. And it's uh, somehow that all comes clear to me when I feel like I'm, and I'm in my garden. And your owl, what was that a sign of? Of course, the owl has different meanings for different cultures. And I'm, I'm enchanted by that. And you did send me the picture. I, I saw oh, that. Yeah. Oh, you got it. Okay. I don't have any special meaning for the owl. Um, and I think it's probably more just in the old folk wisdom of the owl as being this wise, very kind of still creature that, um, and so that was able to unlike other birds, look you in the eye. So I felt like we were looking at each other and communicating in the same way that I could look into a dog's eyes and that we could feel a sense of, of communication. And there was a stillness of, with the owl too, that the owl did not uh, need to, to, there was no fear. There was a sense of, we are just two creatures together in this in the stillness. And so there was a, a very calming presence to me of the owl. But you're an anthropologist. You, mu you must know all kinds of, of owl st stories. And there, there, are many, there are many owl stories. And we <laughs> actually have a relationship with uh, a pair of owls uh, by the American River in Sacramento, where we live much of the year. Uh, two great horned owls. And they uh, had uh, their nest. They had. Uh, little ones twice. And uh, we had quite a relationship going with them and communication with them. It's, uh, it's really something. Uh, these days, so many of us have been suffering from this uh, nature deficit disorder. We've been missing nature and how important it is to get out there whenever we can. And we've taken up bird watching this last year. Uh, and I think many people have st started doing that. And um, the Japanese idea also of Shinrin Yoku, of yep. forest bathing. If simply by walking in the forest or walking in your garden, uh, how it, it bathes us in, in goodness yeah. and all. Yeah, it's in the, some of the local um, psychologists around here love to, are studying that sense of awe and how that's connected to well-being. And that was the first, um, when I talked about the three, the vital connections, I was thinking of this first one of, of awe and mystery and how that, you know, for, for many people that is religion and seeing this, uh, that feeling as embodied in, um, uh, as represented by God, but uh, others I think see this in nature and that we can even feel that same sense of religious re religiosity in in nature, and and if we think of nature as more than just a place to entertain ourselves, but with this sense of awe and mystery and wonder and beauty that 
it does affect our well-being and it's something that that we all need right now and if but like you're saying you know we don't have the same access to it um, and that's why our these little gardens but also plants on our veranda you know plants inside our apartment um, but also this is where technology comes in technology can give us uh, nature through sounds, through apps, through YouTube videos, through, you know, I think we have to get it however we can. And that's, uh, but it's really essential for our, our well being. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we so need it. And how to connect to it. And, and some of what you've taught us today uh, helps us to realize that. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, forget also the, the theme of our conference, which is uh, global leading and learning in the next decade. Uh, what, what thoughts might you have on that, the global leading and learning in the next decade? Well, I'm, I'm at heart a psychologist and I'm, I've spent many years just working on the uh, individual level one-to-one um, and I've expanded that to working more with small groups of people, but I'm, I do like, uh, believe in that expression of thinking global and acting local, that sense of the global, that word. And, um, and I'm very inspired by uh, Grace Lee Boggs, who I also regard as a mentor. Mm. And um, what, what Grace really dedicated her life to was the belief that we could actually achieve social change and social justice if we could keep ourselves focused on our own spiritual philosophical development and what she called the need for the transformation for each of us to have that kind of a transformation uh, and that we could actually accomplish so much just by coming together in small groups in which we practice uh, the art of being more human. Uh, and that's what I I was uh, wanting to demonstrate with this sense of the tea house and um, coming into that space with humility and vulnerability and simply that uh, coming into that space more as a human and being more human with others and that that could be a, a way of cultivating our, our humanity uh, our compassion, you know, as as uh, the Zen Buddhists say, the beginner's mind is the mind of compassion, and that if we can come to that place of actually being awake and aware, that we can move to that uh, sense of, of compassion. And I think that's where um, the reason I wrote that book, from mindfulness to heartfulness, was from some sense a sense of disillusionment of what mindfulness has become in this uh, American Western mainstream culture of uh, individualism in which it has become a kind of a mick mick mindfulness you know as a, com a commodified uh, commercialized materialistic tool for the benefit of capitalism and for to to for the system uh, and for more profit and more achievement and um, it, and i know it can be so much more than that but it can't stop at that place of simply stress reduction uh, and for a sense of how can we make ourselves better, uh, more, more our own well-being, um, but it has to go beyond that. And I think that's where a lot of the, the principles that I talked about in terms of that come to me from Japanese culture, that come to other people from other cultures, um, have that sense of, of broadness and expansiveness that you know you know from your own experience in india you know from your experience in japan you know from your knowledge of other cultures that there is a broader sense of of i and who who i am and why why i'm here and that that is something that that sense of i is we right it goes beyond this personal sense of when you ask somebody what how would you be happy they can't answer it in when we ask it from this kind of American individual view, what's going to make you happy? But it's so like, well, what would make us happy? What would make me and my loved ones happy? What would make my neighborhood, my community? The it goes beyond me, and I feel like that's what 
heartfulness represents to me is that sense that uh, if we can transform ourselves, it doesn't mean society will transform, but it, there's the possibility that if we view our self-transformation within the context of something more global uh, and that we can have the possibility of then uh, rip, that personal transformation can ripple out into um, a greater social sense. I want to echo what you've just said uh, too with um, the powerful lessons we all received from Black Lives Matter last year. Uh, say their names, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. Oh my goodness, there's so many names there. And thank you for sharing Grace Lee Boggs. Uh, I, I also highly recommend everyone to see the work that Grace Lee did. And it is about we, it is moving beyond the I. And of course, we had the, the terrible eye of George Floyd uh, being murdered, killed. Uh, and yet, uh, he, his, what happened through Black Lives Matter, we have learned the importance of the we in, in all of this. And, and I just I'll take this uh, a moment to give a little plug for your book here. This is uh, oh. Stephen's uh, uh, book, From Mindfulness to Heartfulness, Transforming Self and Society with Compassion. Um, yeah, you have any uh, thoughts about the book? I do have a question about it, but uh, yeah. Oh, so, um, no, I, I kind of ex said what I wanted to really that, it, and it's based as you can see from the cover in you know, my understanding of my own cultural background and how that is, has a more expansive sense than uh, the, the individual and that what I uh, wanted to express with that, what Einstein described as we have this consciousness which makes us feel very small and limited, but that our challenge in life is to expand our circles of compassion and our circles that those can keep rippling out as uh, many you know, philosophers and spiritual leaders have described, but even political leaders like Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King Jr. have talked about those circles of compassion. We all need to make those bigger. And I think that's something that we get at much more if we don't go at it from this Western sense of what is the mind as associated with the brain and cognitive thought processes, but is more connected to something beyond that and more expansive, which is the heart and this whole sense of the Japanese word kokoro, meaning the whole, the soul, and the spirit, and a sense of wholeness about uh, the, who the humans are and in the sense of the, in this incredible, you know, vast universe. I, I can't uh, resist asking you, uh, the book itself had uh, wonderful endorsements by your sensei, Richard Kotz and, and also other senseis, Arthur Zions and Mirabai Bush, and of course, uh, wonderful Roshi Joan Halifax. Uh, sensei, what the, you, I can't resist uh, that one. I, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on sensei. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I started doing that as a joke, kind of a joke, but um, it's because it was with my uh, students at uh, Stanford who are undergraduates, you know, so, I did feel I was I'm older than all of them. I'm usually older than all the fielding students too though. But the, there was this, um, I wanted to offer them a different kind of relationship. And I feel like this youth glorification culture has really robbed young people of, of what many cultures around the world have provided in terms of the elders. Uh, and that I wanted to say to them that you know, uh, it doesn't have to be hierarchical, you know, because as you know, sensei is often used with a sense of hierarchy, I'm above you, but that the kanji or the characters simply express a sense of somebody living before, before you. And to me, even the living before is not necessarily just age chronological, but, you know, people live before others in terms of experiences, people have experiences others don't have. Um, and so I wanted to just emphasize that sense that um, I live before you in some ways, uh, certainly by, by years on this earth, I've been around, I've experienced a lot, and I'm here as, as offering you uh, the possibility of a relationship as an elder, not as a peer. Um, and I want, if you're open I, to it, I'd like, I'll share my life stories and it may be uh, serve as a guide for you but I wanna offer myself as this, what traditional cultures have 
you know, call the elder. Uh, and our, you know, mainstream culture calls a mentor, but somebody who is there to offer you um, the kinds of uh, roles I think that we've, so many of us have lost through not having contact with our own grandparents and for, you know, the, the, the elders who were in the villages and towns and neighborhoods uh, who no, are no longer there. And so that's why I've continued to use that word sensei and, and, and grown into it as, as I grow more into that feeling that uh, I am an elder and that I, 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 I embrace that role as being the elder. And, and we embrace your joining with us today, Stephen. My goodness, thank you so much. Much thank appreciation, you. Sensei, uh, <laughs> for all you've shared with us. Uh, I'm going to end, with, uh, end our session uh, with a small sharing. Uh, in, in Japan, as you know, Stephen, there's another flower besides the cherry blossom that, that uh, appears actually before the cherry blossom in the spring. Yeah. And uh, it's the ume the Japanese plum. Uh, this is a photograph that I took uh, a few weeks ago with the opening, the kaika. Uh, the kaika, the opening of the cherry blossoms in Japan is seen as the beginning of spring. It's a symbol of the beginning of hope and so on. And uh, I thought this was a nice way to end our session today with an opening. And thank you so much again, Stephen, for uh, sharing with all of us today. Can I end with one more word, which is uh, to invite people to turn that I can't breathe mantra into I can breathe and I will breathe. And I think, you know, so many of us feel like we're suffocating uh, in this world right now. And to make that mantra of grief into one of mantra of, of hope and faith and saying I can breathe and to do things in your daily life that are focused on the breath with, you know, knowledge of the, the word spirit means breath, right? And it's Latin origins and that the kanji for breath in, in Japanese shows the self and the heart and the soul. And so to keep reminding yourself to breathe and to focus on your breath and to remind yourself to breathe and to say you can breathe and so that will have a tremendous significance in your life. So, and thank you so much, everybody for being here. I can't see you and I can't touch you. Oh, I can't so feel you. I can't smell you, but <laughs> taste you. <laughs> I know you're there though. <laughs> so, thank you so much for coming and being here. Thanks with so us. much, Stephen. Thank you, everyone. Thank